Hello and welcome. I'm Lynn Fries, producer of Global Political Economy, or GPE, News Docs. Joining me is guest Richard kozel Wright. We're going to be talking about UNCTAD's 2022 Trade and Development Report, the TDR. Richard kozel Wright is director of the Division on Globalization and Development Strategies, GDS for short, at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD for short. The GDS division produces the annual Trade and Development Report in line with its responsibilities as UNCTAD's macroeconomic unit tasked with providing original research, economic policy advice, and technical assistance to UNCTAD member states. Kozel Wright is UNCTAD's chief economist and lead author of the Trade and Development Report. He's published widely on economic issues. His most recent book, co-authored with Kevin Gallagher, is titled The Case for New Bretton Woods. Welcome, Richard. Thanks for the invitation, Lynn. So, Richard, we're going to be talking about the 2022 TDR, but first, we should note that this year's Trade and Development Report, like every other TDR since it was first launched in 1981, has been swimming against the tide. So, very briefly, comment on what that means and the broader context of what in 1964 UNCTAD was created to address that's so relevant uh, into the present and specifically this year's TDR. Yeah, 64, obviously, when we were created, uh, UNCTAD was very much the voice for developing countries on multilateral issues, response to all the weaknesses and, and biases uh, in the system that was created at the end of the Second World War. Um, and that obviously was strongly focused on biases and asymmetries in the trading system. Uh, the whole challenges around uh, commodity exporting countries and, and the problem with the terms of trade and balance of payments problems. Uh, but not only that, I mean, UNCTAD from its inception was focusing on the financing challenges, on the technological uh, challenges that face developing countries um, as, as they moved uh, from uh, being politically dependent to being uh, independent economies. Um, the big challenge, why we swim again, and, and very much we were, UNCTAD at that time was, was really looking to reform the existing system. It was, it was not looking to undermine the existing system, it was looking to, to find ways to make that system work better for developing countries. Of course, and that culminated in efforts to create a new international economic order. Uh, that was launched uh, at the United Nations in 1974. Um, and, and UNCTAD was very much the, the uh, intellectual um, backstopping of that, of, of that initiative. And as we know, that, that uh, initiative uh, uh, was grounded at the, in the early 1980s as the global economy shifted onto a very different type of economic path that was... We, and we can we look for words to describe that. I mean, neoliberal is the is the is the one that is often used to un, to describe the shift away from the kind of managed economies of the of the post war period to one in which markets became a much more uh, dominant uh, factor in 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 dictating the kind of economic uh, opportunities for countries at all levels of development um, and and. Uh, the Trade and Development Report, because it was born in 1981, soon after Ronald Reagan took uh, the, the reins of the White House, uh, we've been contesting that shift in the direction of policy making and the, the, the rules of the international economy that, that followed along with that. So, so, you know, we have particularly focused on the way in which uh, uh, unregulated financial markets have had ha have held sway over the policy making and uh, economic prospects of all countries, but particularly developing countries during the last uh, forty years. And so we've 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 moved from being an institution really that focused on fixing the rules of the game to an institution that is focused on contesting the rules of the game that emerged from that neoliberal shift in, 
in 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 ideological uh, thinking and policy making from the early 1980s onwards. The 2022 TDR presents a somber outlook in its prognosis of the world economy uh, for this year and the next across developed and developing regions. So briefly, give us a picture of what you see as some of the main characteristics. Yeah, it's, I mean, in a certain sense, Lynn, uh, we, we, we were swimming against the tide maybe till the global financial crisis, which was a quintessential failure, not of... Of, of government action per se um, or state intervention but was a failure of markets financial markets in particular and um, a lot of talk at the, at the time of the crisis and immediately afterwards that we would at long last be seeing reforms to the international economic system um, along the lines that <coughs> Unctad and, 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 and other people have been uh, uh, arguing for uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, um, didn't happen. And the last, the decade after that was one of very tepid economic growth. There was a lot of, there was, a, the, there was problems with uh, accumulating debt in developing countries. There were problems with wage, wage stagnation in the advanced economies. But finance continued to dictate the kind of direction of the economy. Uh, there was a, the response to the, the crisis was for um, central banks to really hose the runway for capital to to um, continue its uh, footloose activities across the uh, across the across the global economy. Um, and and again, you know that that was clearly producing tensions. Uh, at the end of the at the end of the last decade, we warned back in our 2019 report that unless the tensions and asymmetries that had been building up over the over the post crisis period were addressed quickly, that many developing countries would be facing a lost decade uh, in in the 20s. Now the the COVID the the, the COVID shock opened up the possibilities, it seemed to us, of again revisiting the uh, rules of the international economy in a way that would produce um, fairer and more stable outcomes, uh, particularly for developing countries, but we would argue for all, all countries. And so a year ago, and that, that persisted, that sense of a building back better world was where we were a year ago. With in, in, in the middle of 2021, the, the concerns were that some developing countries didn't have the fiscal space to, to make the necessary uh, uh, adjustments to, to, to the COVID shock. But, but there was a real expectation that, again, this time we were going to do things differently in terms of managing the global economy. Um, and the last year has seen this tr dramatic, quite dramatic shift away from that kind of language, from the language of resilience and fairness, uh, to where we are now, which is in a global economy that is uh, on the edge of recession, uh, with uh, central bankers again dictating the uh, direction of policy making, um, responding to the, the, the increased cost of living in the way that central bankers only can, which is to believe that the problem is one of um, too much money chasing too few goods and that the only way in which you could handle that was, would be through a, sh a sharp monetary shock, r uh, rising interest rates, um, uh, normalising central bank ban balance sheets. And that's happened very, very quickly and and we we argue in the report with with potentially uh, very damaging consequences for not only the 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 advanced economies whose central banks are in essentially in charge of global monetary policy but particularly for developing countries and so whilst a slowdown in the global economy was expected this year from the rapid bounce back of of uh, 2021 after the the lockdowns were were ended and the and the vaccine was rolled out unevenly as we know but rolled out uh, and 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 so we have this combination now of a rapidly slowing global economy particularly the advanced economies 
and and rapidly rising interest rates with the uh, with the with the with the real danger that um, this will tip the global economy into a full blown uh, uh, recession, and that in particular, in the report focuses on this in particular, uh, with with real damaging consequences for developing countries. So when uh, the U.S. Fed responds to the cost of living uh, crisis, as you said, by hiking interest rates, that affects all regions. And rapidly rising interest rates, and in some cases, the, the risk of an associated currency mismatch, makes life harder for borrowers. And so those firms, households, and governments that have taken on debt for whatever reason. The report shows that while all regions are exposed to these kinds of risks, it argues that developing countries are the most exposed. Can you elaborate more on this point that you've been making? Yeah, I, obviously developing countries, as I said, accumulated debt um, in the period uh, after the uh, uh, global financial crisis. It was not an irrational decision. Real interest rates were were either z zero or negative, and and it made sense in many respects to, to um, to to borrow on international capital markets, and they were willing to lend often to, to countries that had not in 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 recent years been able to borrow on, on those markets. So a lot of debt was accumulated in the in the decade after the financial crisis, and and as the fiscal squeeze tightened during COVID, they borrowed more to 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 maintain. Uh, some uh, sense of economic normalcy. Now, again, interest rates, as you know, remained particularly low during the the COVID the COVID period. And again, there was uh, there was reasons why developing countries uh, sh should do that. With that, we've entered now a very different world of, of of rising interest rates, and there's a very very serious danger now of a vicious circle taking hold, in which, as interest rates rise. Uh, international investors become nervous about the investments they've made in the developing world. There's a flight to safety, uh, often in uh, the deeper financial markets in the United States. That produces impacts on the, 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 the dollar. The strengthening of the dollar has been a notable feature of the last few months. And for developing countries that borrow in dollars, the pressure of uh, rising uh, cost of borrowing and their declining currencies is 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 a is a potentially uh, very dangerous squeeze on on their economic uh, prospects and and that's already happening some countries have for a while been saved by uh, relatively uh, vibrant commodity markets um, but for those countries that are net importers of food or fuel uh, th that that's an, an, an additional burden when it comes to their uh, payment position. So there's a real set of forces, even before the war in Ukraine uh, further ramped up um, some, uh, some detrimental effects on, on global economic prospects, but where developing countries were clearly staring into a very uh, dangerous economic waters. And, and as developed country central banks continue with their policy of uh, raising interest rates in the hope, we think a false hope, that they will, that will squeeze out inflation, then, then the, the, the coming year for many policymakers, policymakers in the South is, is a very, very troublesome one. Now, on top of that, the, the threat of uh, climate shocks, as we know, is intensifying, and in, you know we saw that recently in the case of Pakistan, where the floods covering a third of the country with billions of dollars worth of, of damage uh, caused by that adds another layer of um, uncertainty and, and damage to 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 countries in the developing world, and you know that that. This, 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 what people are now referring to as a poly crisis facing developing countries on the economic, environmental, social, and indeed political fronts, is is a very, very worrisome um, situation that that the international community. I mean, certainly the, the the institutions of of global economic governance that were set up 
to provide safety nets for, uh, for, 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 for countries facing these kinds of troubles just does not seem to be fit for the purpose of meeting the kinds of compounding challenges that, that many countries are now facing. So Richard, you've given us a, a picture of the short term. Let's turn now to the medium to long term prospects for the world economy. So global growth, financial stability, environmental sustainability, and also development in the South. In the TDR, you propose a modeling scenario that extends the current conditions into the future. So a continuation of the status quo in which policymakers uh, don't break from the uh, orthodox playbook. So please give us some idea of the assumptions of that scenario and the outcomes. I mean, there is a business as usual model that that will simply go back to the kinds of policies that we saw in the in the period following the global uh, uh, financial crisis um, which uh, with a strong emphasis on monetary policy uh, lack of coordination between monetary and, and fiscal policy uh, a, a strong emphasis on the need for flexibility uh, of, of markets um, uh, adjustment for countries that come under bounds of payments pressures by uh, by the indebted country with with no real uh, demands placed on the on the creditor countries. So, so the familiar playbook that we've seen uh, in place uh, uh, before before COVID hit, and as we try and model that kind of policy regime. And its impact on developing countries, we 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 see uh, a particularly weak pattern of economic growth, uh, weak employment generation for developing countries. That means a continuation of a large informal sector of uh, low uh, wages and and limited uh, protection for for workers, um, and 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 very little hope under that those kind of uh, conditions of countries meeting the sustainable development goals and perpetuating their vulnerability to climate shocks and certainly no sign of a meaningful uh, tra transformation in the structure of their economies in a way that is consistent with uh, the, the need to move away from uh, a carbon-based uh, growth path. So, so that's the kind. Well, that's what we understand to be um, the, the 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 business as usual uh, type strategy. And 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 in light of the the fact that this does not deliver on the kind of transformative, sustainable, more inclusive outcomes that the international community has set itself, and we argue with, that we need to see a very fundamental change in the kinds of of policy. Um, programs that all countries, but particularly developing countries, need to pursue over the coming decade. Um, and, you know, that means a break with austerity. We need a, a much more expansionary type of macroeconomic environment. Wages need to take a much more prominent uh, role in leading the expansion, um, in cutting wages endlessly in the hope that you will gain a competitive position in, in, a, in the global economy is ultimately um, a zero-sum game. Um, and so, so, so a shift to a much more balanced monetary and fiscal policy regime in which all, all, all monetary and fiscal levers are used to uh, underpin a, a more expansionary agenda um, we, we 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 understand in that context particularly when it comes to meeting climate goals that there needs to be a much more prominent role for public investment in in, sh in shifting the, the the structure of economies I mean and that's obviously true when it comes to moving into different types of energy system 
um, a more efficient use of that energy in, in the different sectors of the economy, but also when it comes to the provision of, of transportation and the, the range of utilities that make up a, a balanced economy which need to be provided by the public sector and, and, and not have, have, have suffered over the last decade or more from a mistaken uh, ideology around public-private partnerships and blended finance and and other and and, uh, and and other miracle cures that have not delivered on 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 the on those kinds of promises so so we make a we we offer a, a scenario and trying to model a scenario in which countries begin to follow that kind of policy regime rather than the, the business as, uh, as usual um, uh, model that has failed to deliver over over the last decade or more what we've tried to do in this report is to emphasize the importance of greater south-south cooperation as offering a framework in those in which those kinds of policies can really take hold in a in a more effective way than has been the case uh, in in recent years and you know it's you know as we look at the 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 evolution of the global economy over the last 20 or 30 years, I mean, it's, it's clear that the weight of developing countries in, in the global economy has increased if you look at their share in global output or if you look in their share of global exports or in their share of global foreign direct investment. There's been this significant shift uh, towards uh, uh, developing countries as being much more important players uh, and contributors to global growth than was true 40 or 50 years ago. I mean, that's clear. A lot of that, as we know, is down to China. But it's not just the China story. The, the emerging economies, particularly in the first 12 to 15 years of, of this new century, were, were, were significant contributors to global growth. And that opens the opportunity, we think, for those countries rather than to fixate on their relationship with the advanced economies to find greater opportunities to integrate with each other in a way that can support the kind of uh, a positive uh, policy agenda that I outlined and in the process create the kinds of virtuous circles in which uh, expanding markets, rising incomes, rising investment, increased productivity performance, feeding into uh, greater markets within the South can become a more uh, visible part of the, of, of, of the global economy. I think, and so that, and we model that in, in this year's report, and we do show that under the right circumstances, though that increased cooperation amongst developing countries will indeed produce uh, benefits in terms of employment, in terms of government revenues, in terms of investment uh, within the developing world. I, th I think, though, it's with, we are very insistent as we try and outline that kind of alternative. Uh, to the business as usual approach, that it's, it remains the case that in our interdependent world, in which a lot of economic and political power continues to rest with the advanced economies, we need a shift in the multilateral system if we're going to scale up the kinds of initiatives to meet the global problems that we fit and that's that, that we all face, particularly obviously with respect to climate. So this is this in no way can be seen as a substitute for the kind of reforms to the international uh, economic system that UNCTAD has been arguing for uh, really since since 1964, but with particular. Uh, uh, emphasis uh, in uh, o over the course of the last uh, two decades. So the need to ensure that we have multilateral financial institutions that provide the kind of liquidity that developing countries need if they do face unforeseen uh, economic shocks, the c uh, which of course should be the responsibility of the International Monetary Fund uh, and, hasn't, and, and, and has not been done on the scale that is needed in response to the shocks that we've seen since since the global financial crisis, but also the need for much, for a, a more reliable, uh, cheaper, long-term financing to make the kinds of productive investments that developing countries need to uh, to transform their economies in a 
in a more sustainable way, um, that has to come from the the multilateral system on a much more scaled up, uh, in a much more scaled up way. And 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 it would, it, it it's not the case that the increased South South cooperation can somehow f- substitute for that need for 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 much greater multilateral efforts. So I think I think I think what the South South agenda does is point. To, in a more positive direction to the kinds of reforms and initiatives that the multilateral system will need to follow if we're going to achieve the kind of uh, goals that the international community set itself in the in the last decade. So as we've been discussing, the structures of the international system of finance and trade were designed under the hands-off business as usual model. So as this international rules-based system put in place extensive deregulation since the 1980s, all governments, but most especially less powerful governments, so small and developing countries, lost what you call policy space. And if I understand it correctly, the idea of the South-led scenario is, is that by cooperating and integrating among themselves gives developing countries uh, scope to regain uh, policy space. In other words, within their respective regional arrangements, governments would have room to pursue policies that do work towards a fair outcome for all, rather than uh, just find themselves constrained in having to follow policies as dictated by the so-called market forces, more appropriately uh, called the concentrated market power of global finance and uh, the multinational corporate structures that dominate uh, the market under the auspices of the hands-off model. You've already given us a a picture of vulnerabilities linked to power asymmetries uh, in the context of the international system of finance. Let's bring the international system of trade into the mix and more specifically vulnerabilities linked to the concentrated structure of global production. Uh, the concentration of corporate power across economic activities has become a much more visible uh, feature of the global economy uh, over the course of the of the last decade or two and and you know we know that the vast the vast bulk of international trade for example is controlled by a relatively small number of corporations and and I know there's a kind of fixation in some quarters about the need to support small and, and, and micro enterprises as, as engines of economic growth and their, their the possibilities. But these are, these are not players in the international trading system. So taking on the, uh, and tackling the, the uh, asymmetries in, in the structure of production is certainly going to be a critical feature of the kind of um, uh, alternative development path that we're talking about, but again, we're already un- there's all the the ten- that's not a tension that is unique to developing countries. Uh, we've seen around the questions of uh, digital corporate power the the need for uh, policymakers in advanced countries to address the problems that 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 can cause them. We see, you know, we, that's that's been true particularly in, in Western Europe in recent years around the issues of taxation, for example. Um, so, so I, I, again, it's a, a progressive agenda that, that can begin to forge a new kind of internationalism will need to take uh, full account of the, of the tensions and contradictions that the, that the uh, financialized and corporatized global economy has posed to advanced economies uh, since since the new millennium I think we need we can't again it's we can't simply expect countries of the south acting together to provide the kind of by themselves provide the momentum for change there has to be significant changes within the advanced economies themselves and their approach to international cooperation if we're going to build a fairer and more sustainable future. Given your views on where we are now, and this a continuation of three to four decades of the perpetuation of the business-as-usual model, 
What makes you think that this time around we could see a change uh, in direction away from the status quo towards this more positive uh, agenda that you describe as a virtuous circle? It can be, it's, it's easy to look at what the advanced economies are doing, particularly in the international realm, and, and be very pessimistic about, about the prospects for the kind of, of changes that, that, that you just mentioned. I th- what, 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 but there are, there are some reasons, I think, to have a, a, a more positive outlook. And that, and that comes from the fact that the advanced economies, since the global economic, uh, the global financial crisis, have in many respects been saying one thing about the need to maintain the status quo and doing something else. And we can see that particularly, for example, with the re-emergent debate around industrial policy. And industrial policy, part of our scenario about a, a more inclusive and sustainable development path, hinges on the, on the far more extensive use of industrial policy than has been the case under the hands-off, business-as-usual type scenario. And, and, and we're seeing a far greater use of industrial policy in the United States. Right? I mean, it's often couched in a way that is not particularly um, progressive, so the, the, the recent uh, efforts of the United States to counter the, uh, what they perceive as, the, as their falling behind uh, East Asian countries, particularly China, but not just China, in the area of certain of semiconductors and certain types of new uh, technologies has forced the US into reassessing its own industrial policy the kinds of initiatives I think that 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 implies will and already are falling foul of the international trading rules that were designed under this hands-off business-as-usual approach. You can't do the kind of industrial policy uh, that the United States is currently uh, pursuing in a way that's consistent with the with the with the rules of the of the Uruguay round, so that is going to force significant rethinking. I think, if I take a positive view, of the international rules of the game with respect to trade and trade and investment agreements, um, and and the developing countries need who are who have suffered the most under those rules need to kind of f- uh, form a positive narrative out of their own experiences of of closer integration with each other that can be used to make the international rules of the of the trading system work in a fairer and more inclusive way so there are i think there are developments both within the south but also within the advanced economies that that at least hold out the possibility of shifting uh, the the um, the workings of the global economy in a direction that can deliver greater sustainability and fairer outcomes for all. Again, if I understand it correctly, uh, part of the strategy behind the South-led scenario is that when countries act as a bloc in their respective regions, whether that be an African bloc or a Latin American bloc, this then can be a lever. And as put in the report, to quote, policymakers in the South share critical common ground to be capable to question the asymmetries and biases in international trade and finance that favor large corporations from advanced countries. Leveraging this shared interest opens a space for a South-led way to counter the status quo. Does that then mean that political will will be needed among policymakers in the South if they are going to leverage uh, their shared interest and open that kind of space? Well, I mean, it's Politi- it's political organization. I mean, you're, you, it's certainly the case that the developing world has not been able to make the gains that it needs to make because it has been fragmented itself. And that, and that the need for it to build cooperation amongst itself is a critical component of forging the alternative. And there are economic advantages 
to themselves from closer integration. That's what we show in the report, that if they do forge these closer uh, uh, trading and, and financial uh, uh, technological ties, there are real gains that they can make uh, 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 amongst themselves, and, and, and that needs to be exploited. I think the, the second side of that story is whether in the process of building closer relations amongst themselves, they can leverage that to a change in the multilateral system that brings the kind that ultimately will determine for the global economy whether we, 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 we do get the kind of inclusive, transformative, sustainable future that the international community has been promising itself since 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 certainly since the middle of the of the last decade with the initiatives around the sustainable development goals and the paris climate agreement so so yes there are big there are gains to be made from closer south south cooperation but i think the 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 real challenge is to ensure that the kinds of solidarity that the south builds up uh, uh, through those kinds of closer arrangements translates to changes at the multilateral level, which will ultimately determine whether we, 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 we achieve the kinds of goals that we set ourselves. I'll just state the obvious and, and very quickly flag for viewers that the report details many more features that, that characterize ways the South-led scenario breaks from uh, the status quo than we can possibly talk about today. And that includes details on an agro-ecological model of industrialization where employment um, intensive and traditional agriculture are part of a coordinated effort to maintain a, a pace of agrarian transition consistent with industrialization, employment generation, food security, and the need to avert environmental degradation. So again, as we need to keep this conversation at a manageable length, let's just focus today uh, more specifically on the issue of food security, on how agrarian policy fits into uh, a framework of a broader industrial policy consistent with sustaining employment in uh, developing countries. Yeah, I've, you know, we have again tragically been exposed to the threat of food insecurity over the course of the last year. Hunger is on the rise again uh, across large parts of the South. And, and you know, that addressing that problem needs to uh, think very hard about the kind of agrarian uh, relationships that, that exist in the South and the vulnerabilities uh, that, that um, exposes uh, many countries to. So, you know, it's, in, our, in our understanding of, of, a, of a, a sustainable growth path, I think it would be true to say that industrial development which has been on hold in many developing countries now for two decades or, or gone backwards, needs to be revved up to make the kind of transformation that we're talking about. But that should not come at the expense of thinking about uh, other uh, structural imbalances that, that continue to... Um, uh, uh, continue to limit the economic possibilities that the developing countries face and you know we know that as as agriculture has been hollowed out in the south the consequences of the of the of, that that has had in terms of the emergence of informalized urban economies uh, is not a route for the kind of gro the kind of inclusive growth model that we think developing countries need if they're going to meet uh, the sustainable development goals. So there's an intimate relationship between uh, what happens in the ag agricultural sector and the possibilities of uh, the kind of industrial development that developing countries we think still need to be able to pursue. Uh, the report also uh, makes it clear that because you don't want to propose anything that's unfeasible, the South-led scenario is based on, on modest assumptions. So you're not creating mechanisms from scratch, but what you're doing is intensifying existing uh, mechanisms. So uh, you take existing arrangements and, and uh, enhance them to the point that you think it's uh, realistic and feasible. 
For example, in the case of finance, you propose scaling up the existing uh, mechanisms for countries within their respective regions of the South to rely more than before on their own respective currency for trade between themselves and to build common stocks of reserves to help stabilization efforts and uh, for greater scope uh, in regional stabilization funds, etc. So then within respective regions of the South, the focus of this report is very much on scaling up what's already in place. Yeah, look, I, you know, I mean, I mean, not, you know, the scale economies matter when it comes to a dynamic growth process. And developing countries have, have tended to think of those scale economies coming from their building closer ties with advanced economies. I mean, and there's a logic to that. I mean, what all we're saying is that there are huge opportunities to achieve uh, economies of scale if developing countries uh, 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 integrate more closely with each other. So, so you know, that kind of mechanism is, is, is certainly critical for, the, for, the, for the, um, the growth path that we are outlining. But, you know, there are certain things that, are, that can only be tackled through a reform multilateral system and, and of which the most prominent of course is the is the burden of, of debt because obviously China has emerged as an important creditor over the last um, uh, decade or more but but the creditor debtor relate the, the asymmetries in the creditor debtor relationship remain fundamentally uh, north south uh, and, and and with a much stronger role for 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 private creditors in the relationship between uh, advanced and developing countries. And, that, and, and that's a huge burden that unless it is lifted over the next few years will prevent the kind of uh, uh, progressive growth path that we try and outline in the report. And that will require some fundamental changes to the multilateral system if, if we're going to alleviate that, that burden of debt on developing countries. That's not something that can be solved by closer South-South cooperations. As further context to that and other asymmetries in the global economy and how it relates to the hands-off scenario, the TDR argues the hands-off scenario is tied into a, a vicious circle where increasing disparities of power, wealth, and income lead to repeated crises followed by the mismanagement of those crises that further perpetuate an unequal and stagnant world economy. And as statistics to flesh that out, the TDR refers to two well-known, deeply ingrained trends. One, that the labor share or the wage share of income has been falling in advanced and uh, in developing countries since the 1980s and uh, another that government spending has been decreasing as a share of national income for four decades. And that the flip side of those two trends being how from 1995 to 2015, uh, the real benefits of global trade went to the profits of the corporate 1% who control over 50% of international trade. Um, that uh, reported in the 2018 TDR. Can you expand on that? One of the important points that we've tried to make consistently in recent reports is that the world economy as a whole has suffered from a shortage of, of global demand. And that part of the reason for that is that um, there has been a persistent tendency to repress wages and to the point where wages in some countries have essentially become disconnected from any improvements in productivity growth. I mean, that's largely true of the world's largest economy, the United States, where wages of real wages, at least, have been stagnant for decades. Um, now, now that and and so in the case for a wage, there's a case to be made for a wage-led growth model that uh, stimulates uh, economic growth in a very virtuous uh, type of circle. And I think that's true for both 
uh, certainly true for advanced economies, and we would also argue it's true for many uh, developing uh, countries as well. So, so, so that 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 understanding of the growth dynamic uh, lies behind a lot of of what we have to say. Now, you know, there's a, you can make a case that rising profits can themselves offer a dynamic growth story if those profits are reinvested productively and and we and we've seen examples of that in the south china the china model to some extent is is a model in which there has been a rising profit share in the economy but but there has also been a, a rising share of investment in 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 overall uh, um output in income and and that has been a major part of the success of the china story excessively so some would argue but without a shadow of doubt for a period of 30 or, or, or years or more that has been an important engine of the of the china growth story you don't see that in the advanced economies for the last 20 years even as the share of profits in overall income has been rising investment has been Stagnant. It's one of the great weaknesses of the of the hands off or the neoliberal agenda. The neoliberal agenda was sold as being good for business and therefore good for investment and innovation. But when you look at the at the distribution of profits, uh, this increased share of profits that are being made by large corporations, the vast bulk of it over the course of the last two decades or more has gone to buying back shares. Or, or allocating dividends. The work of Bill Lazonic, for example, has shown, uh, and for the, for, has shown that for the uh, firms in the uh, S&P 500, in excess of, of, of 90% of profits have been used for those two purposes, not, to, not for reinvesting in capital formation or improving human capital, but for, for buying back shares or, or handing out dividends to the 1%, who, as you know, have a very low, a relatively low marginal sense, pr- pr- propensity to consume, which is one of the reasons why we've, we face this problem of persistently uh, low uh, aggregate demand. Uh, so, so, so tackling those problems, I think, is, is uh, those systemic problems is one of the great challenges that that uh, we face, given that the kind of growth path that we uh, set out in the report and in previous reports does depend on a transformation in the in the in the structure of the economy that can only take place with relatively uh, high uh, rates of investment. So, so you know, moving away from 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 that business as usual model, we see offers opportunities for for raising investment, for raising productivity, but also for raising wages uh, at, at the same time. It's that kind of virtuous circle that, to some extent, I mean, you got to be careful with historical analogies, but to some extent, was the modus operandi of northern capitalism. In the period in the in the three two or th- two and a half three decades uh, from the end of the from the end of the second world war so that 's the kind of that 's the kind of narrative that we want to generalize across the global economy. We see opportunities for that in in the kind of closer south south relationships that we model in the in in this year 's report but again it 's imperative that the advanced economies also embark on their own reform process that can break with the, with the kind of stagnationary tendencies and highly unequalizing tendencies that have marked those economies now for, for three decades or more. This global policy model scenario lays out how a South-led agenda of industrialization and coordination aimed at avoiding climate meltdown and uh, promoting employment generation globally is technically possible. Yeah, it's technically possible, but we live, ultimately we live in a world where 
you know, it has to be politically possible, right? It's not, it's, and, and, and the politics of this is where the struggle is taking place. And I, 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 you know, I think, and I think, I think the South has to demonstrate that a, a politics built around solidarity and cooperation offers not just a, a, a morally superior way of organizing economic and social life, but also offers one that uh, is more prosperous and and more sustainable and and that i think that's where that's that's where the narrative uh, of south south cooperation really needs to um to 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 build a, an agenda that is much richer and more powerful than the the one that has for now 30 or 40 years uh, establish itself around this notion of hands off is better and individual and, and a kind of individual initiative and and endeavor are the only ways in which we can achieve the kind of better future that we are that we are all aspiring to this then would mean the south assumes a leadership role in shaping the global economy and so breaking from a decades-long experience is rule takers, not rule makers. And so too breaking a dependence on comfort and conformity, as the report puts it, or on being on the right side of a commodity boom or a geopolitical divide. So in a South-led scenario, the narrative changes to we're on the right side of a policy agenda that we are forging and going to fight for. That we're going to fight for and that... And that will not only be good for us, but will be good for the economies in the advanced world too. Uh, you know, I, I think I think that's I think that's critical, right? So that the the leadership in the advanced world can can themselves think about a different way of of pursuing uh, international. Uh, 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 engagements and, and 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 coordination, because the system that we have in place now is simply not delivering the kind of the the, the scale or the nature of resources that we need to 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 to, to prosper together on on an increasingly uh, stressed planet. Developed countries have their own challenges that are different from those in the developing world, and they'll have to find uh, instruments and, and mechanisms to deal with those those challenges that are not necessarily um, appropriate for the South. But the, I, th I mean, there is a there is a demonstration effect from South South cooperation that will that we hope will will oh, encourage leadership in the North to think about their own problems differently. And a rethinking, too, of the relationship with China? Yeah, China, I, I, obviously, uh, you know, the, the kind of hostility towards China that has emerged, particularly over the last four or five years, is not conducive to building a healthy multilateral system. And, and the advanced economies need to get over the um, the this the fear that they have of an increasingly um, powerful and prosperous China because that's going to happen. I mean, China is going to become an increasingly more prosperous and powerful economy, and you know the the Western world needs to come to terms with that and and to find and again that requires a narrative built around cooperation and coordination rather than uh, competition and conflict and 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 you know i think i think developing countries and some developing countries have their own concerns about china but the the initiatives that that china has built around the belt and road and and the and, and other things i think 
with, despite the fact that there are, there are clearly issues that need to be uh, dealt with there. Again, it's a, it's a sign of a, of a change in the world economy uh, that, that offers a different kind of future from the hands-off approach that has sh misshaped uh, multilateralism over the course of the last four decades and back to where, where you started, uh, against which we've been swimming for much of that period. Richard Kozel Wright, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. And from GPE News Docs in Geneva, Switzerland, thank you for joining us.